Sages for millennia have been searching for the answers to complex questions like, why is it that a stranger can tickle you but you cannot tickle yourself? Or can you beat Dark Souls 1 and 2 at the same time with one controller? I will have to explain. Dark Souls 1 and 2 are considered some of the most difficult games ever made. And since I am a certifiable psychopath, I thought it would be fun to complete both games simultaneously, with input for both games coming from a single PS5 controller. Let me give you the ground rules. Number 1. I must finish both games at the same time, which means that the final cutscenes are to start in a matter of seconds between each other. Number 2. One of my characters cannot idle while the other one makes progress. In other words, I can't just sit at a bonfire or put myself against the wall for an extended amount of time while the other character progresses. This being said, I will run into the wall at times because both games are very different and designed differently. Number 3. Progression in both games must be almost the same. If I progress too far in one game, I will start the whole run over. First up, I named my Dark Souls 1 character Tyler Durden and I was ready to experience hell, escaping the prison of my own mind while being in the middle of nowhere. A few moments into the run, and I realized an exploit. When cutscenes play in one game, I would gain sentience in the other, allowing the freedom of progression without being hindered. I accidentally named my character Darla Singer instead of Marla Singer while getting the Estes Lust from Oscar. And just like that, I slayed Dicky Minaj to escape the asylum in the pretend land while I chose my class. I made it to Lordran on my way to Majula so I could go to Blight Town for some extra souls. I realized that I would be doing a lot of walking into walls in both games, while walking into doorways in both games. It's very convoluted, I know. Got my first real taste of combat by slaying the internal demons of my lost childhood, flailing about like I hadn't taken my medication this morning as I inched towards Hades Tower of Flame and up the Berg. My goal was to get to Dragon Rider around the same time that I got the Taurus Demon, so that I could progress evenly throughout. I had a plan on how I was going to finish both games in a certain amount of time, because I could generally finish both games in about 2 hours or just under 2 hours. I cheesed the Dragon Rider at the same time I was pretending to be a bush, and slaughtered Bigfoot on the Brooklyn Bridge and I was off, to exact my current plan. The plan was to gather exactly 1 million runes in Dark Souls 2, so that I could bypass the four Shardbearers for the Shrine of Winter, while I ran the any percent route in Dark Souls 1, which was the least amount of upgrades. Gathering upgrade materials in Dark Souls 1 is what takes the longest amount of time. By running the Crystal Halberd and then getting the Giant Blacksmith Hammer, I would forgo a lot of time in Dark Souls 1 and keep both playthroughs on an even keel. Next I was on my way to the Forest of the Fallen Giants and the Undead Parish to fight the Gargoyles and the Not So Last Giant. I made it to the bonfire at the Undead Parish at the halfway point to the boss fight in Dark Souls 2 as I was attempting to buy upgrades from Andre the Smith. I was fighting the last giant and had to keep myself from hitting him so he wouldn't beat the living crap out of me. If you've ever pissed off Andre, you know he's a Hulkamaniac, and he lets Hulkamania run wild all over your ass, brother. Luckily, since the last giant's room is so large and circular, I was able to run up to church to go fight the Bell Gargoyles. Lightning Resin made quick work of the Bell Gargoyles, and I was able to progress to the first Bell of Awakening and on my way to the Pursuer in Dark Souls 2. It was at this point while cheesing the Pursuer that I realized I would have to use a plus 5 broadsword to fight Quelag and the Iron Golem, both of which wouldn't take much damage from it because it's a terrible weapon at such a low level. But since existence is pain, I figured what the hell. I upgraded my weapon in both Dark Souls 1 and 2 almost simultaneously. Sometimes it's kind of creepy how the runs sync up. I had returned to Firelink Shrine and obtained the Dull Ember so that I could upgrade my character's weapons in Dark Souls 2. Along the way to Quelag's domain, I decided to murder a treacherous imaginary asshole. I ran past the Walmart security guard to grab the fragrant branch of YOLO, so that I can gain access to Brightstone Cove, Seldora. Had another mental breakdown fighting imaginary agents of existential dread, just before the Quelag boss room. Then I had the chance to use my powers of seduction on Spider Mommy Milkers. 
The damage was terrible, but eventually she went down with not much of a fight. Picked up some more swag and rang the second bell of awakening. I achieved ceaseless discharge around the time that I decided to fulfill a childhood fantasy I had of becoming a wishing well coin. Now with the second bell rang and my weapon at plus six, it was time for two of the worst zones in Dark Souls history. The gutter and Sen's funhouse of horrors. I will spare you the details, but let's just say that I would rather get a rectal exam from Captain Hook than run through both areas at the same time again. If you've ever played Dark Souls 1 and 2, you can kind of imagine how terrible it could have been. Somehow I made it through both areas relatively unscathed. When I had made it to the Rotten, I had accidentally jumped off of one of the ramps that the boulders fall down and landed at the bottom of a pit. Somehow my character had survived, which gave me a window to actually finish the Rotten boss fight. I really did luck out at that point. I made it to the top of Sen's Funhouse around the time that I started my date with Great Value Brand Quilag. Murdered another steaming pile of crap while running for my heterosexual tendencies. As I was slam dancing at the top of Sen's Funhouse like a new metal kid at a Papa Roach concert in the early 2000s, it was time to take on the Catholic Church. Tickled the iron golem with a Q-tip that I called the sword and took a dive in the water. Caught an Uber to an Orlando and committed domestic violence against a religious woman. I'm going to go over progression again. Since I arrived in Orlando, this was the halfway point in the run. And since I was farming the rotten to attain 1 million blood echoes, I needed to make it to both the Lord Vessel and the final bonfire ascetic around the same time to be even in both runs. So I did just that by progressing into Orlando and ringing the bell to bring the pirate ship in No Man's Wharf to find my way into the back end of the last best deal for the last bonfire ascetic so I could farm the rotten one last time and get the lord vessel from ONS. The run was progressing as smoothly as it possibly could, even though it felt like I had sat on a pair of scissors that were sticking out of a park bench on a hot day in Arizona sun. I gutted a fat man covered in gold and went after the final bonfire ascetic to kill the final rotten. As crazy as it sounds, I synced up the next boss fights together on purpose to see how difficult it would be. Which was a complete mistake like when Miyazaki made the Dark Souls games. I must have tried for at least two hours to fight both bosses together and ultimately ended up barely winning in the end. But at the end of a traumatic event, does anybody truly win? I'm gonna tell you, I definitely didn't. I'll be left with emotional scars on my brain for the rest of eternity. I made it to Bed of Chaos around the time that I made it to the Shrine of Winter. I was able to open it because I had gotten my soul memory to a million. I delivered the killing blow to Bed of Chaos while being attacked and accosted by a poison hollow. What surprised me was the amount of symmetry that was happening between the runs. I was getting better at running both games simultaneously with one controller. Was it perfect? Of course not. But I was getting much more skilled at it. And I began to feel better about the run since I was on my way to the castle and we were towards the last leg of both games. But of course the next roadblock would come. I was going to do another two areas that were extremely difficult together. I was on my way down to the catacombs and at the same time I was on my way up to the castle. Which means that I would be doing the Tomb of the Giants and the Shrine of Ramana at the same time. Which are two of the most difficult areas in Soulsborne history as well. I butchered a virgin who was grieving for his dead family and entered into the chaotic darkness that was the Tomb of the Giants. Now I'm going to explain why the Tomb of the Giants is absolutely terrible. It's pitch black in there and there are a ton of enemies waiting around every corner not to mention all the steep cliffs that you can fall directly off of and die instantly. Shrine of Amana isn't any better. It's just different. There are also steep cliffs that are hidden underwater so you can't see them directly. Not to mention the enemy placement and the amount of enemies and the types of enemies that are in Shrine of Amana. There's a bunch of sniper sorceresses all over the place that love to shoot you from afar. It's a cluster fucking a pain in the ass to get through. Anybody who's played Dark Souls 2 knows how painful it is to get through Shrine of Amana. So now imagine a sandwich with both turds inside of it. And believe me, this turd sandwich tasted like shit. I finished off Nito's smoked ribs on the halfway point of Shrine of Amana. I had to continue down the paths and work my way towards Sif, the big blue dog. I joined the local neighborhood gang by talking to the cracked out wall kitty. At about the time I was carving up mushrooms for my spaghetti meal. Got mugged in Detroit, Michigan while fighting one of the weirdest bosses in Dark Souls, the uncircumcised demon of Schlong, which is basically a frog with a giant foreskin face. It's very terrifying. 
While fighting off the voices of insanity in the old folks' home, I booped the doggo in the snoot with the newspaper to assert my dominance. And I had made it to Veldstadt, the Royal Aegis, who's one of the final bosses in the main game, as I was setting up for the Four Kings, which is another final boss but in Dark Souls 1. Which means I was traversing New Londo Ruins at the same time that I was running through Aldia's Keep. Both very difficult areas, just not as bad as Shrine of Amana and Tomb of the Giants. I made it through Aldia's main gate at the same time that I got the crest from Ingward, and just in time to make him super uncomfortable by fighting an imaginary dragon. Started the Four Kings fight around the time that I made it to Dragon Eerie to get the Aged Feather. I rolled around in the abyss of an abandoned wooden shed. Got this boss like the other bosses in the run in the first try because I'm so used to fighting them on a constant basis. If it hadn't been for that, I'm pretty sure this run would have been a lot more difficult. I was running through Dragon Shrine at the same time that I entered into the Duke's archives, which is kind of ironic because while I was sacrificing myself to one dragon, I was making peace with the other. And we were keeping good pace and making good time as well, which surprised the hell out of me. And that was it. We were almost done. The last two bosses in the last two areas we had to traverse were the Duke's Archives and I had to work my way back down to the Giant Lord, which happened to be in the Forest of the Fallen Giants, which we had previously been in before. But we were extremely close to finishing the game. Or the games, should I say. Dispatch Seath, the nudist meth selling dragon, who was protecting his last crystal, and got ready for one of the lamest bosses in Dark Souls 2, the Giant Lord. With the last two bosses slain, I offered the Lord Souls, and teleported back to the castle for the final fights in the game. This was the moment of truth, whether or not we were going to beat Dark Souls 1 and 2 at the same time. After minutes of glorious stabbing, it came down to Darla Singer and the throne security. But because the rapier is such an OP weapon, it was an easy fight for me. Beat to death one of the most disappointing final bosses in any video game. And it was time to parry Hobo Santa Claus to death. Nobody's supposed to talk about Fight Club. And that's why Gwen didn't know that Tyler Durden could parry him to death so easily. I easily parry baited Hobo Santa Claus's AI to death in another very disappointing final boss fight. And in a period of seven hours, we finished Dark Souls 1 and 2 at the same time. Not only that, the cutscenes were literally about four seconds apart. There's something majestic about watching two final cutscenes at the same time. If you're wondering where I got the idea for this run, it's from my favorite content creator of all time, a man named Paul from Mitten Squad. I would like to say thank you, Paul, for enriching my life with your content and your personality. It meant so much to me. This is going to do it for this video. If you like the content, please leave a like. If you didn't like the content, please leave a dislike and a comment telling me how you didn't like it. See you guys next time.